Hello and welcome to Crossing Borders with Nathan Lustig, where I interview entrepreneurs doing startups across borders and the people who support them, with a focus on companies that have some relationship to Latin America. Last week, I talked with Nora Leary, co-founder and head of marketing and business development at Launchway Media, about how to get press in the U.S. and what it's like starting up with three female co-founders in Latin America. My guest today is Nathan Klar, founder of Bridgecrest Medical, a wearable that helps mining and oil and gas companies around the world track employee performance to avoid accidents and keep employees safe. Nathan was working on some technology while at university and saw the coming wearable wave and realized he could use the technology he was working on for good. After raising $1.3 million from VCs in the Bay Area, Nathan continued to build his business, selling to some of the largest mi- multinational mining companies in the world. This journey took him to Latin America, where about half of his clients were, including his first his first ones, high up in the Argentine Andes Mountains. We talk about the challenges of doing business in Latin America as a U.S. company, how investors looked at having half of his clients in Latin America, support systems from LATAM governments, opportunities he sees for LATAM, and technical challenges he had to overcome while leading his business to be acquired by Ability Wearables. We'll also talk about how Nathan sees wearables in the future, where the industry is going, and whether he thinks he might end up back in Latin America in the future. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Nathan Clark. Where, where, what we work are you in? They opened a new one in San Diego, actually. It's huge. It's like 88,000 square feet. Hello, Nathan. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for taking the time to do it. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Yeah. So where in the world are you today? So I've recently moved back to Southern California um, from San Francisco. So I'm based out of San Diego now. Awesome. And why did you decide to move to Southern California? So I actually recently sold um, a startup I was working on. And we evaluated setting up or, well, staying in the Bay Area versus moving somewhere a little bit cheaper. And I think uh, for us, it was the right move to try to build out an office down in Southern California. And so what was the company that you just sold? I started a startup Uh, called Bridgecrest Medical. Yeah. Yeah, So what what did your company do? So Bridgecrest used wearables, uh, wearable watches to predict whether heavy industrial workers were at risk for accidents at heavy industrial sites. So essentially we were taking biometric data. So activity throughout the day, heart rate, sleep data, and classifying workers into risk categories. So red for high risk, yellow for medium risk, and green for low risk. And then we would give this data to the safety manager every morning actually before they even started working and the idea was you could actually predict who was likely to have an accident beforehand um, and the safety manager would then go ahead and intervene to prevent accidents at the job site really so how did you come up with that what made you start a business like that it's it's pretty interesting um, at some level I think this company was a leap of faith that only sort of someone who was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed coming out of university could have done. Um, I had a, a prototype product back then that was a little bit different. And I had cold emailed a major mining company with a pitch prototype and a, a general overview pitch of the business. And they actually loved the idea. And so with them, we went through a process where we ideated and and innovated on the initial product um, and came up with the idea for this company. Awesome. And so when we first met, we were connected because you were doing some business in Latin America when you were based out of Northern California and I was doing some stuff in, in Latin America as well. What made you, what brought you to Latin America as a place to sell your product? So I mentioned that company and it's a great question. Um, because I didn't, when I started this company, I wouldn't have actually thought that this was the place I was going to be. But the nature of these industrial companies is that they're global. Um, and for me, the first site that they asked us to go to and deploy our fatigue management solution on was actually based in Argentina. 
mm-hmm. and it was based 14,000 feet in the Andes Mountains. So you can imagine me, you know, taking this product the very first time, having to, you know, fly somewhere which at that point was pretty foreign to me, um, and take it up into the Andes Mountains in Argentina. Um, it was a pretty amazing experience, um, and that actually was the first time. I became introduced uh, to the Latin American market. It's a funny story because it was it was actually really tough to import these wearables to Argentina in 2014. Um, they still had a, a slightly Peronist government in place. Um, and I'm not sure they actually had an import code for wearables. And so it, we had to actually go ahead and uh, get really creative about how we were going to import these devices. Um, and it was a really tricky experience um, and w- one of my first experiences with Latin America. But um, at the same coin or on the same coin, you know, it was one of my top experiences because as soon as I came back from Argentina and while I was in Argentina, it was really apparent, like readily apparent that all the industrial companies that were going to be op- operating in Latin America were a huge market for us. Um, so it changed the course of our business. And did you have any experience with Latin America previously? Uh, no, I did not. And did you speak any Spanish when you first went down? Yeah, so I speak conversational Spanish. So I, I did it in university and it's gotten better after doing some business um, in Latin America. And how was that experience when you first went down with conversational Spanish and, you know, Argentine Spanish is not the easiest to understand. It's different from probably what we both learned in high school and college. Um, what was that like? Yeah, it was, um, it, it's definitely different, right? It's, um, it's like, say, Shamo, you know, the, the Yamo, um, LL is, is a lot different. It was probably, it was pretty tough to understand. I think, you know, whenever I do business or, at least when I was starting, um, and still a lot today, uh, we try to find a local partner. So for me, we had very good local partners from the start. The mining company that we were working with at the time was, you know, hands on pretty early in the process, helping us get the product, um, to the state it needed to be. And then while I was in Argentina, I had the opportunity to bring on some really strong local partners while I was there. Um, and I think that was, you know, really key in helping navigate the market. What was the the timeline from when you first sent your prototype um, with the proposal to the mining company to the time you had your first test? I think it was around six months, but that, and that was just typical big company process. Mm-hmm. And, after you you had your first test in Argentina, did you go back to the States and try to concentrate on the U.S. market or did you decide, you know, we want to f- have a big focus in Latin America? Generally, what we were doing was, was we were selling into companies in the States. So the office that I sold into for that was based out of Salt Lake City. Mm-hmm. Um, but because they had global operations, we were often essentially told, hey, you guys have experience deploying the product in South America. Let's pick a South American site to go ahead and use this as. So we would basically, our business became, you know, partially in the States uh, at at U.S. sites. And then the other half of the business was based down uh, primarily Peru, Chile and Brazil uh, selling and deploying there. So you had you had a, a nice a nice setup there where you were selling into the states, but then got to travel some to do the implementation. Yeah, it, it was good for an initial for like a small sales team, absolutely, because we were selling locally. Um, eventually, though, we definitely decided to expand out the sales team uh, through a number of different arrangement types into South America. So we eventually had a a strong local presence um, in our core markets where we were selling to some smaller companies in those core markets. What year was, did you start the business and send out that first prototype? Uh, we started in January, 2014. And so six months later you were down in, down in Argentina, um, getting, getting things going. 
And so how did you how did you scale from your first client or two into something that was in multiple countries across Latin America, sales in the US, and then later in acquisition? What did that process look like? So specifically talking about South America, um, the strategies we use there, because I think it might be kind of interesting to your audience. I think one of the core things was having strong local partners and business partners. So as a startup at that time, you know, we didn't want to go through the six month process of onboarding a major um, distributor. We needed to show some results. So we actually looked for individuals who wanted upside and a piece of a U.S. technology story um, who were pretty agile. We looked for sector experience. Um, and we actually had success with under like three different models with these kind of in, with these kind of people um, and, uh, you know, gradually deepened. But basically we had some and as we grew these these change, we had some of these people under contractor models. We also had some agency sales agency agreements um, with with people. Um, and then we had uh, eventually we actually formed a local company and entity um, in one of our markets. Uh, and so I think the most important sort of thing that tied all these people together and, and made it successful and allowed us to sell or to scale all these different sales models was figuring out, you know, what the comp structure is that allows you to attract attract that key talent in those markets. And did you find the comp structure to be different either by country in Latin America or differences between Latin America versus the US or was it pretty similar? It's different based on the market, absolutely. So by country it's it's slightly different, I would say. It's not a huge amount you know the, the raw percentages are different i think the the absolute cash flows are going to vary based on the price of your product um because you're going to vary your pricing differently for different markets so you can't charge essentially what's u.s pricing um in peru for example so well you still may be giving someone you know five points on a referral um in both of those markets, the total amount, total dollar amount is going to be different. Um, but you know, more importantly, I think than saying, you know, this is the standard contract was saying, Hey, I need to pay to get this sort of talent, um, to help me grow my business. And this is what it's going to take. Did your salespeople in, when you decided to make teams across Latin America, did you mostly find local partners it, or did you bring people from the US that spoke Spanish fluently and wanted to get into the into the market? Which did you find to be better? We had local partners, um, which they were very effective, though I was doing a lot of selling at that time, you know, and when I would sell, I would sell to enterprise clients. So actually, my pitches were mostly in English, um, some Spanish pitches. I would have our local partner do it, um, but because we were selling to really global companies, high, you know, a lot of the executives, you know, top executives in those companies were were very fluent in English. So there are a couple experiences I had where we attempted Spanish presentations, but um, they actually said, "Hey, listen, you know, let's do this business meeting in in English. Um, it's it's the right way to do it." And <clears throat> did you? As you as you scaled and you worked towards an acquisition, how did that happen? Was it something that you just got a contact in that and, and the process started? Or is it something that you were working on um, in the background to sort of work towards or you had a process where you knew that you wanted to get bought at a certain point? Towards the end of last year, we knew that we wanted to sell the company. Uh, and so we actually ran a process for that. Um, and I think it was the right move for us at that point because we needed to take the company to the next level and to service these clients that we were servicing. Um, we wanted some additional half behind the business. Um, so it came down to a decision around that. And how big had you gotten in terms of either people or clients or whatever metric you like to use before you sold? 
we had around 25 enterprise clients at that time um, and we were about 15 people and what percentage of that was latin america versus other markets staffing or enterprise clients uh the Both. client side that's difficult so we had actually a lot of overlap so i would say 50 percent of our clients were in latin america or had latin american presence at that time that's interesting and did you did you ha have any investors previously or did you bootstrap it yourself we raised 1.4 million dollars in in a seed round for the business um, mostly from venture capitalists in the bay area and what what was their reaction when you were talking about you know half of your business is going to come from latin america there wasn't significant pushback and i think it was because we had enterprise clients who were you know reliable businesses who paid checks i think if you were potentially in the Bay Area saying my market is in Latin America and you don't have any prior experience in Latin America like I didn't at the time, I think they would they might question your ability to not only acquire co clients but also to get them to actually to pay you because um, you don't have any AR um, and you don't have any presence down in South America. But I think because we had enterprise clients and we were only targeting, you know, top 200 global natural resource companies, we were able to, to essentially not have very much pushback at all. That's really interesting. And do you think that it helped that you were already based in the Valley that you were able to do that? I think so. Yeah. And so I'm going to jump back all the way to sort of the beginning for a second. And, you know, how did you decide that you wanted to get into starting a business yourself? Was that something you knew you always wanted to do or um, it came up when you were going through school? It was actually initially a technology idea. So I, you know, I think a lot of entrepreneurs have a history of, trying things and trying to start businesses. And so I, I had that history, but initially it was an idea around this new technology shift, um, being mobile health devices, being wearables, being able to take how we were collecting data um, around people's health and biometrics and make it mobile, um, and then push that to the cloud for very cheaply um, and run analytics on it and capitalize on that, on that trend, uh, that technology trend. Um, and then turn that into a business. And was the prototype that you started with, did that end up being pretty much the product you sold or did you end up with lots of changes as you uh, started the implementation? A lot of changes, a lot of changes. And I think that's to be expected coming from where I was coming from. We didn't have a ton of industry now, direct industry knowledge at that point. We had a technology thesis. And so when we brought it into a vertically oriented, you know, SaaS space at the time, which is what we were selling, um, we had to do a lot of learning. Um, but I think it panned out. I think our technology thesis was right. We just had to take the product through a lot of different. Areas. And so you, you mentioned the yet a SaaS business model, uh, which is pretty well understood by pretty much every company in in the U.S. market. Did you have any? issues taking that sort of a model down to Latin America um, where maybe they weren't used to doing a software as a service business model or were you able to um, find people that knew what you were talking about? Yeah, so we did. And I think especially our customers were used to doing CapEx. Um, so it was, it was a trick. Like a lot of the time, you wouldn't expect this, but they actually wanted to pay for hardware that we were going to throw in for free. You know, it was easier to structure contracts that way. And and you'll see in our early contracts, we, we had to do a lot more of that where they were paying for upfront hardware. We were reducing the monthly cost. As, you know, we got from 2015 to 2016, especially to this year, 
companies have gotten really comfortable with a SaaS model. Um, and so we don't have very much, very much change, or very many, excuse me, changes to our contracts at this point. But uh, definitely, definitely in 2014, 2015, it was a challenge. Yeah, we, we've seen a similar shift from about that same time period, 2013-ish to 2014. We had a lot of our B2B companies in, in that are doing business in Latin America um, having to do exactly what you say, where they'd have some sort of big setup fee or they'd mark up the hardware really a lot and then have a really low um, monthly recurring revenue. But then over, say, yeah, the last year or two, we've basically moved almost every contract to a software as a service. So it, it, it's been interesting to see the market mature even in a pretty short amount of time. Yeah, it, it is really interesting, but I think it's a great thing to first startups. I think it makes it a lot more viable. Um, and you know, you're going to be able to, if you do think about raising outside capital, like meet those metrics that VCs look for a lot easier. Because you did a lot of a lot of business in Latin America, what would be some of the top most unexpected things that either you found yourself about doing business in LATAM or that people in the States now would say, wow, I, I didn't know about that? You know, we were able to take advantage of a lot of the government innovation programs. And I think that's good. Um, it allowed us to meet a lot of people. So we, we were competitive about building a brand name for ourselves and about being involved in, you know, government competitions um, and also a couple grants to establish local presences in the country. And whenever we did that, we made sure to tell a lot of people in the local market that we were doing that. Um, and I think that was huge for us in being able to export into those places. Um, and I think people in the U.S. don't understand just how active the government is in promoting innovation and new company creation in these markets. I think in the U.S. we have sort of a more hands-off approach like like government stay out of my business. You know, we've got a very efficient uh, market and, and generally we're pretty good at creating new companies ourselves. Um, but I think we could actually learn a few things from some of the more innovative programs that are going on down in Latin America. And I know that, you know, Nate, you were involved in the startup Chile for a while. And I think that's a, you know, perfect, it's a perfect example, in my opinion, of, you know, one of the really top, innovation programs in the world coming out of, you know, more government involvement. Yeah, it, it, I was in the pilot round way back in, in 2010, as I think we were the fifth or sixth company to, to go through the program. And it's been shocking yeah, to me that a state or a city in the U.S. hasn't done it on a small scale, where deciding to award twenty to $40,000 of equity free money setting them up with office space, setting them up with um, access to the legal system and contacts in the area. I mean, it's such a low cost um, government program because there's no fat. It's literally the money is going to entrepreneurs. They're going to spend the money in, in the city or in the country and build the local economy because it is about getting the best brains to the best spot. And I think a lot of these countries or even cities in the U.S. that have tried to do innovation programs to be Silicon Valley 2.0 and built these huge innovation complexes and spent huge amounts of money at late stage venture capital or given tax credits to venture capital. It just doesn't really work um, compared to bringing 100 smart people or 300 smart motivated people per year uh, into the same spot. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think that kind of model, I, I would love to see it more in the States. And I still think, I actually almost saw it in one place in rural Virginia that I thought would be very good early on. Um, they were paying basically, they were seeding companies with about $300,000, but they had to essentially move to this town. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, I think it's just, it's perfect, right? It's a, it's a great way to, to draw that brain power. It doesn't take that much money from a government perspective. Um, and it's just super efficient. So I, I think it's fantastic. 
I think you saw Brazil do Startup Brazil. Um, and, and I think there are ways for government to be effective in, in seeding these new technology companies that we should adopt here in the U.S. Yeah, Puerto Rico has uh, Parallel 18, which is a similar program to Startup Chile that um, their current executive director is, was an ex-executive director from, from Startup Chile. So more countries are doing it, but the, the U.S. still has, has, has kind of lagged behind. Do you have any, do you have any specifics on um, programs that either you used or saw that you think other people from the States might be interested in, in different countries in Latin America? Yeah, so I think if you're a Latin American entrepreneur, um, the 1776 Startup Challenge is really good. Um, and I would recommend doing that because it's staged. So you can make it to a certain round, you know, in your city, you can make it to a certain round in whatever your con- in whatever country you're from. And you can also, if you're good enough, make it to the global round where you're going to get a lot of international attention and recognition. But at each of those stages, you have a chance to sort of promote your company and what you're doing and build a brand. And I think that's, you know, so I love how that's set up because you can take advantage of it depending on how far along you are in your business. So I think that's a great one. And we participated in that. And then I also think in Endeavor, I've heard fantastic things about Endeavor. I've met a few entrepreneurs who are involved in Endeavor who have loved it. So I would definitely recommend that one too. Yeah, they, they've got a good infrastructure across Latin America and even a little bit in the in the U.S. And I've had definitely some good stuff with them as well. Did you have any specific government programs that uh, you could recommend or places people should look for government programs for setting up either R&D or an office or something like that in a specific country? In Peru, um, Consatec is a good program, um, which is put on by the government. It's more focused on R&D and research and development funding, so probably an earlier stage of a business. But you know, I think it's very supportive. It's high profile, um, and it can help you build a business. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I think it is one of those things that is surprising to people from the states where they don't realize how much government help there really is. What about going back the other way when you were meeting? Latin Americans either doing business with them or either Latin American entrepreneurs that are in the States or people that you met, what was the most surprising thing to them um, when you talked to them about doing business in the States? I think the degree of competition is surprising um, at some level because in the U.S. things are fast moving. And you have people who, you know, highly, a lot of highly educated people who believe that they can do startups, which is probably a little bit different. Like if you're a smart, highly educated person in, in Latin America, your first instinct is not going to be to, you know, quit your high salary job and, and go start a new highly risky startup. Um, I think because there's more infrastructure in the States, it's kind of more, it's more accepted, like more of whatever that population is, is going to go out and take that risk. So I think that's one of the big surprises. And I think once you have amassed that critical, you know, mass of like highly competitive people, things move pretty quick. So I would just say that that's probably a little bit surprising to Latin American entrepreneurs when they come and try to compete in the U S yeah, and we, we've seen that as well um, with some of our portfolio companies that are starting to make the jump where to the states where maybe they're not sure that they can compete because they think it's moving fast, but then when they get there, it's actually moving faster, but then they surprise themselves because they actually can compete, which I think is, is kind of fun to see. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you have a lot of competitive advantages um, around cost efficiency um, when you come to compete in the States. And so, yeah, I I completely agree with that. I think we did a lot of things where we staffed um, people in some Latin American countries. And we, you know, there were a lot of advantages that came out of doing that. So I, I completely understand why you would be seeing that success. Can you talk a little bit about 
how the hiring process was similar or different in Latin America to um, the U.S., either in terms of things that you would, could ask in the interview versus recruiting or anything that might be interesting there? Yeah, you know what I loved? I loved had a really highly developed market on AngelList. I, it was super easy for us to hire in Mexico going through AngelList, um, which is a little bit different than some other markets. But um, but yeah, I thought that was really cool. So um, if you're looking to hire in Mexico um, and you're coming from the U.S., I would highly recommend uh, using AngelList. And you can find some pretty good engineering talent doing that. So I, I would definitely recommend that. Did you have specific cities in Mexico that you went to, or um, did you have distributed team? Mexico City was where we focused. Oh, yep. Yeah, Mexico City is awesome. Um, you know, if, if you haven't, if you're from the U.S. and you've only been to you know resort Mexico, if you can take a week or a weekend even and head to Mexico City, check out what's going on there. It, it's completely different and really interesting place for for tech right now. Yeah, Mexico. Mexico City is great. I mean, culturally too. So much going on. Great food. I I can't wait to go back. Yeah, really, really fun place. And what about other places um, outside of Mexico where you hired people? How were you able to do it? Did you use local job portals? Did you word of mouth? Um, what kind of experience was that like? Pretty much everything else we did was word of mouth or connections um, for hiring. But to be honest, that doesn't differ too much from what we did here in the U.S. too, which was a lot of, you know, what, who are the talented people in your network? Um, and, I, and I think for a small business, I, I just generally like to hire that way. I think that there's like a lot of success stories that have come out of the tech space. Like when you look at PayPal and the PayPal mafia, you know, what Peter Thiel did is he went to all of his employees and said, hey, who are the five smartest people you know? And then he went and he, and he, hired, he tried to hire all five of those people. Um, and I, I think that's just a great model because if you have smart people in your business, they're going to know other smart people too. Yeah, that makes makes good sense. So for, for companies that are trying to raise money in the States that are based in the States but do business in Latin America, what would you tell to the investors um, – that are looking at those deals about why they should or shouldn't be investing. Um, if you have thoughts on both sides of the pros and the cons, it'd be interesting to hear. Yeah, so I think if you're running a business or if you're investing in those markets, um, you need to be afraid of sort of a grab effect, like grab taxi. And, and I think it kind of goes across South America. I know grab's based in, in Southeast Asia, but basically, you know, what's going on with Grab and, and local competitors to Uber is they just know the local market better and the local competitors do. And so they can they have just much better product innovations in those markets. And you as a U.S. company are forced to play catch up. Like and once you start to give your competitors the ability to define the product marketplace or the product roadmap for your company, that's a, that's a really bad place to be as a company. So I think you got to be afraid of that. Um I think there's some vertical SaaS products where that becomes tough. So I think fintech and legal tech can be difficult if you're going to, it can be difficult for a US company to compete in a local market unless you're very talented or have a very strong local presence there. Because I think you'll probably miss some important product differentiation things. Um, now, that being said, I think if you're looking at do, as a U.S. investor at investing directly in Latin American companies, um, you know, I think there's a, basically a, a huge field of opportunities in Latin America and, you know, a really fast growing middle class that all has smartphones that, you know, really wants to grow and use technology Um and, you know, loves talking about technology. And so I think um, there's a lot of opportunities there. How about going back the other way um, for same thing with investors who are potentially looking at deals that have 
uh, a tech team or a sales team in Latin America, but are targeting the U.S. as their their main market? I think you want to have a highly confident sales force that believes they can go into the U.S. and sell. Um, like that's one of the key team indicators for me. Um, and it's really about that team knowing or ha at least having the confidence to and being able to learn how to close enterprise deals in the U.S. Um, so I w if you're a B2B company uh, or any sort of sales deals in the U.S. Um, so that's one thing I would definitely look at. And I think if a company has that, then they're going to benefit on, you know, not only being able to come into the U.S. and close deals quickly, they're also going to benefit because they've got huge cost efficiencies over U.S. companies when it comes to, you know, running their back office. And I know that's a thesis of Magma Partners. So um, I'm probably just, for, you know, sort of preaching to the choir, but I think that's that's pretty important. Yeah, it's it's one of the things that we we truly try to focus on because we think you know, if you can have somewhere between a sixty and eighty percent lower burn rate than you would in the states, um, sometimes even more, um, you just have a, a longer runway. But you're exactly right; you need to have those sales processes down in the states, or you know it's just not going to work. So, do you so since you had a distributed team? Um, in lots of different countries, you had consultants, you had projects, you had employees. Did you have any specific services or strategies that you used to keep everyone on the same page, whether that's software or just, you know, meetings weekly or things like that? Yeah, I thought that the time difference, um, was not a big issue, which was nice. Um, you're basically looking, you know, Brazil's four hours ahead. Peru and, and Chile are about two to three to four, depending on, you know, where you are. Um, so we were able to do things like daily stand-up meetings that I think would be difficult if you had a team in, say, India or things like that where you're dealing with like a 12-hour plus difference. So um, I think you should definitely take advantage of that. A 10-minute daily stand-up keeps everyone on task and uh, can keep things moving, moving pretty quickly. So I'd recommend doing that. I think Slack is a great tool um, and pretty easy to use and keep everyone on. So those are two of my recommendations. What do you see next for you? Are you, you thinking you're going to do anything with Latin America in the future or are you back into the States? Yeah, so I'm actually flying to, as part of Ability, the company that acquired Bridgecrest. I'm actually going to Brazil next week. So I will, uh, you know, be back in the thick of it, uh, in very short order. And so what do you think is, uh, how has it been different for you as you, uh, moved through the acquisition process and now are sort of supporting the deal, but still going back to, to Latin America or to your old clients or new clients? We've had a, overall a very positive response, I would say. So I think at this current time, I think <clears throat> what's exciting is to be able to sort of take a step back and <clears throat> appreciate all the innovation that's going on um, and think about, you know, how to leverage that um, and help the company that I'm, that I'm with. And so I think it, it's allowed me, I think, at some level to take a breather and like really get a lay of the landscape and uh, try to figure out where it's going. Yeah, it's it's definitely important to take that breather. I mean, I that was one of my, I think, mistakes between my first and second company is I look back on it and think it was crazy. I started the second company literally a week after we got the check for the acquisition. And oh, wow. <laughs> it was still, <laughs> I mean, it was, I don't, I don't regret it or anything, but it was crazy. I wouldn't do that again. <laughs> it would take some time. So I think you're definitely doing the right thing, making it, uh, making it count. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's crazy though, man. You did a week after, huh? Yeah, it was, it was absolutely crazy. Definitely shouldn't have done that. <laughs> What you think are the next kind of interesting things in, in your industry? 
Um, so you built a pretty cool product in in wearables. Where do you see that industry going after uh, where it is today? What's kind of the next two or three coolest things that you think we should know about? So I think it's not entirely new, but it should be coming soon and has been coming soon for a little while. There are some people who are working on really interesting things around electronic tattoos, where it's, it's, it's like essentially a wearable device that you can honestly color like a removable tattoo. Um, and I think that's pretty cool. So I think you'll, by, by changing the form factor, you're going to get a pretty big increase in efficiency for these devices. I wow. think wearables be, becoming a standalone device is a more immediate term change. That's pretty cool. Um, and then I, I think you'll actually see sort of as my third point, I, I know I'm going through these quickly, but the, I think the third point is consumer wearables have proven to be a pretty tough market. So I think over the next couple of years, you'll see a lot of more vertically oriented wearable plays come out where you're solving a very specific problem. Um, sports wearables are getting pretty big. So companies like Catapult, um, I think there was a startup out of Boston that just did a deal with the NFL um, to do wearable tracking as well. They're, they're called Whoop. Um, so you're starting to see these sort of big adoption into very vertical specific wearable spaces, which is kind of cool. I want to jump back to that tattoo thing because that, that sounds really cool. It's probably the only type of tattoo that I would get. <laughs> but how, <laughs> how, how does that work on a – it just is a, a wearable that's thin enough that it just sort of sits on you? It's amazing and you, you kind of almost have to see a picture of it. But basically, yeah, it's, it's like do – you, do you remember those removable tattoos you could get as a kid? Yeah. It's like one of those. Yeah. So just put, sort of paste it on, let it sit, and then uh, you can pull it off later. Yep, exactly. That's really cool. And do you think the first steps of that are going to be um, for just, you know, for fun, for fashion? Or what are some of the uses that um, for outside of just sort of fun that you see for that? So I think the big challenge they're having with those is getting the price of them under a dollar mm -hmm. because the idea is that you can eventually throw them away. Um, so you wear it for a short period of time and then eventually you can essentially get rid of it. So, and, and then it creates a model for the company that makes it where you have, you know, hundreds of these consumed by a single person in a year. So that, that's pretty cool. Um, so actually I think as they try to push the price lower, I think, the first thing you'll see it pop up in is the medical space because it's a place where you, you can a get pretty concrete val value out of this like you could track parkinson's disease you could track you know fall detection so i think you'll see some things pop up there first and then as the price gets pushed down i think you'll see it in the consumer space that's cool i'm definitely looking forward to it do you have any other industries or technologies that you've seen um either since you sold the company or just being in the Bay area that you think people should be looking at or things that you're really interested in? It's hard not to be excited about AI, but I know everyone talks about that. So I can skip that one if you, if you want. Well, are you on, on AI? Um, where do you come down on the, and how scared are you about potentially, you know, the Elon Musk part where he thinks potentially we could, summon the demon um what side are you on on that uh <laughs> on that uh debate i uh i think there's legitimate reason to be concerned but um i don't think you can stop the march of history on this one so i think it's a it's a management problem yeah it's one of those things where yeah, I'm, i agree with you completely that now that you've got basically any tech is going to happen <laughs> once people figure out oh maybe i can do this whether it's gene editing or um or ai someone's going to do it but I, I do think there is risk there i think it's something that a lot of people are maybe not thinking enough about um outside of maybe small circles in, in silicon valley and 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 some other places yeah 
Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think the potential there's you know potential like network attacks that can happen and you know use of AI and sort of cyber war, which is going to become more pertinent too. That's is to worry about in the medium term. So, yeah, it's a big it's a big thing. One of the things that surprised me about AI in the Latin American context was that I thought that it would take a lot longer for AI products and AI uh, uses to get into sort of the medium and large companies in Latin America. But I've seen lately, especially IBM's Watson, um, being used by some of the older kind of establishment companies in, uh, in Latin America, which, which was pretty surprising. I thought it was going to take longer. So it's it's a good sign things are you know making progress here. That that's good. That's cool. I didn't know that. So I'll, I'll check that out. Do you have um anything else that you'd like to to cover or to talk about? I think, you know, ag tech in Latin America is a cool space right now too. I don't know if you want to talk about that. Yeah, so we've seen a lot of interesting ones, especially in Mexico. And then um, a couple that are from Argentina, but have gone into the US and, and other parts of Latin America, um, where there's so many challenges in Latin America that maybe we don't see in the US that people are coming at solutions from completely different angles that actually work in the US as well. Um, What kind of stuff have you seen that that's been interesting? So I saw that Microsoft had a, like a hundred million dollar agricultural tech fund started in Brazil. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, I just think the macro trend is interesting because, you know, just frankly, to feed meat to and, and this is gets a little bit away from where we've seen exits because we've seen most exits come in in uh, you know more sort of vegetables and and growing food but to feed meat to chinese indian and south american consumers you need a lot of arable land and one place where there's a lot of arable land is in uh south america so you've seen i think people started to seed some funds like the microsoft fund that i mentioned um in brazil uh and places like where they think that you can actually set up production facilities uh, to go ahead and be able to feed all these new consumers coming onto the market. So I just think that's kind of interesting as a macro. Yeah, I think so too. I think as I think it's about 300 million people, if not more in Latin America, um, are starting to move up the ladder into sort of middle income uh, or lower middle income where they're having more and more beef, they're having more and more pork. And consuming things, not just electronics and computers and phones, I think it's it's definitely a mega trend that's that's been interesting already, but will continue to be be there. Do you have um, any you know really surprising or interesting stories of something that happened on you know, either a business trip or a, a story of something that went wrong with with the product that you were able to fix? that may be unique, unique to Latin America that you could share? Yeah, so we, um, we deploy a lot, or we initially deployed a lot of product in the Andes Mountain range because essentially up there, the air is, you know, is thinner um, and people are more likely to get poor restoration, so around sleep and you know, keeping their bodies healthy because it's tough to sleep. Um, and you know, when you try to sleep, you often have a lot of interruptions. So you go to work very tired. So we deployed a lot of product up there. So getting people, you know, to have the product synchronized correctly with, with servers and, you know, getting that connectivity up in, uh, those really remote regions is, was, you know, an incredible challenge, but one that we managed to surmount. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and was something that is probably pretty unique to that certain geography. How did you manage to do it? Did you add um, cell towers to, to the areas where you were, or did you connect up a different way? Some of the clients we worked with had to make Wi-Fi improvements like cell towers and um, increasing the, the blankets of the that the Wi-Fi was available for on-site. 
Yeah, it's one of those things that we don't really think about much in in the states, but I know Chile has an interesting story because if you put Chile on its side and put it in the US, it goes almost from New York all the way to LA. And you have to have the same cell phone company that works all the way from north to south. And today that's <laughs> that's solved, but you know, when cell phones were just getting started, if you think back to the US, we had pretty local cell phone networks and you couldn't jump from place to place. And Chile was one of the places where they first started testing really long distance um, cell phone coverage all on the same network. So it's it's pretty interesting to to hear about that. That is, that is, yeah, it's a unique challenge, right? I think as a technology company in the US, you don't think about those things when you go into a new market, but you very quickly learn about them once you get there. Yeah, it's I think that Mike Tyson quote where, you know, everyone's got the plan until they get punched in the face. I think that happens harder in, in Latin America than maybe than in <laughs> some of the other places that you can do business. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. And I love that quote, by the way. It's, it's the truth. Yeah, it really is. So do you see yourself in the future ever doing any business again in Latin America after you finish up um, with the company you're with now? Yes, yes, I, yeah, I do. I think, I think it's a great place to do business. I love doing business there. It's a lot of fun. Um, you know, have the best business dinners of anywhere in the world. You know, at uh, Churrascaria restaurants and uh, and you know, in, in Argentina, great steak. So I can't miss those. And I think it's you know, a fantastic place just generally from a market perspective. It's a growing market. There's high rates of technology adoption that I've personally sort of anecdotally seen. Um, and I think there's definitely an emphasis on adopting new technologies. So it's a, it's a great place for a technology company to do business. If you had to give advice to somebody who's maybe in tech in the US, maybe they work for a startup or they've got their own business or they're an investor and maybe they don't want to actually do business in Latin America or they maybe are interested but not now. Where would you tell them if you, they had maybe two one-week trips per year uh, or this year that they should go check out uh, across Latin America? I think they should go to Santiago, Chile and Sao Paulo, Brazil. I think those are the two most developed startup ecosystems in Latin America. Um, and I think they would be really impressed. And I think it would really open their mind to the possibilities there. Yeah, I think those are really good choices. Um, the other ones that I might think of are uh, Medellin and Colombia and Mexico City or Guadalajara um, in, in Mexico, I think are, are all pretty interesting spots. And even if you just come to meet some of the companies or t take a look, you're gonna have a great time on your vacation anyway. So um, I think it's, it's <laughs> definitely something worth doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, cool. Uh, thanks again for taking the time to to chat with me here. Um, I think we've got some pretty interesting stories for people in the States that um, maybe don't really know much about Latin America yet. And then also, I think it's interesting to hear your perspective um, as somebody from the U.S. doing business in Latin America um, for the, the locals that – when at least I don't know, did this ever happen to you where somebody would say, well, but you're from the U S why are you here? Why are you doing business? Uh, that happens to me all the time. I don't know if that happened to you, but, um, it gets to have a perspective of what it's like for someone from the States to, to do business across LATAM. Yeah, it did. It did. And I think, um, I think it's a good opportunity to explain all of that. So no, thank you very much for having me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as you keep going, maybe we can have, uh, another, another version six to six months or a year down the road as you've kept going and get an update and hear where you are. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add before we, uh, get you back to, to your night? No, no, thank you very much. And yeah, I would love to do it again. Awesome. Well, thanks again and, uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks again for listening. 
If you enjoyed my conversation with Nathan, please be sure to recommend Crossing Borders to a friend and rate us on iTunes and Stitcher. Check out previous episodes at NathanLustig.com.